dark, cold world out there. There's a time to live and a time for a man to die. There are places for dead men in the earth and the sky. Don't you venture too far now, cause you can't come back. From the place where the good guys always dress in black. Hello everyone and welcome back to another edition of your favorite wrestling podcast. This is Ring Respect Radio. I am Bobby Munson and I am joined by the man with the angelic voice. He is Mr. Papa Smokes. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Munson. How's all my wrestling people doing out there? We hope you're all doing wonderful, staying safe, and guess what? We're looking forward to hopefully seeing a whole lot of you come October 30th in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. Prairie Pro Wrestling is back to live in-ring action on Saturday, October 30th from the Saskatoon Senior Centre. Uh, you can get your tickets right now at Bar Tari, Wendell Clark's Classic Grill and Bar, and also at Glitch Gifts and Novelties. And I don't know, Papa Smokes, rumor has it that we might be close to sellout, if not by the time this comes out, sold out. So if you haven't got your tickets, don't bother showing up at the door because we are very limited, very restricted due to COVID-19 restrictions as well, too. So only a limited number of fans will be in the attendance at night. But guess what? We've got something special. If you can't make it in attendance or you're living somewhere that you can't get to Saskatoon, we will be taping the show and it will make its way to YouTube like all the other Prairie Pro Wrestling action. And Pop Smoke, speaking of that, we just released the first four matches that we taped Back in March of 2020, before the pandemic, we got another four coming out real soon. Didn't that feel great just to get back to calling the matches again? Yeah, it sure did after all that time off. And uh, I just feel good about the fans getting to, uh, some of the product to watch right before the next live show, the rebirth, as it were. Check out uh, our YouTube channel for PPW Wrestling and uh, just whet your appetite to get your little appetizer going and uh, remember all, all the all the wrestlers you like, all the wrestlers you hate, and to get ready to cheer on October 30th. So, yeah, speaking of live wrestling action, we're going to be talking about one of our favorite live wrestling shows, uh, MLW Fusion Alpha, here today. We're also going to be talking about the main event from MLW Fightland between Jacob Fa 2 and Alexander Hammerstone. And also, another treat on the show here tonight, we're going to be about halfway through the show, we're going to take you to an interview with one of our favorite members of the MLW roster. He is Mr. Bud Heavy. He had a great sit down with myself and Papa Smokes, and we're going to be bringing that to you here today. So before we get started, though, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and click the subscribe button down below. Turn on the notification bell so you know anytime we release new material right here on the Video Bros Network. Uh, also, make sure to check out our friends at Backbreaker Media, who have been doing a lot of great support here for ring respect radio putting our podcast at all different outlets and medias that we don't normally reach out to ourselves the canadian wrestling network who have been big supporters also of our podcast and also a quick hello to all my friends at love wrestling if you haven't gone and checked it out i am the antagonist of love wrestling on sunday sunday brunch uh get keeping it real and keeping to uh, being myself uh, what you hear from me on this show is exactly what you'll hear from me over there but come check it out as i uh feed it to some people who are from the uh, the other side. Anyways, uh, enough about that. Uh, let's move on to today's show, MLW Fusion Alpha Episode 3. So we've been uh, going over the MLW Fusion Alpha episodes that have been coming out here, and what a great bunch of episodes they've had so far. MLW Fusion Alpha 3, and this one kicked right off into action, Pop of Smokes, no waiting around. We had the 5150 slash LAX coming out. This is Slice, Boogie, and Rivera, I believe, were the ones in action. Dr. Julius Smokes and Conan in their corner, and they'd be taking on Injustice. Uh, let's uh, let's break this one down here, Papa Smokes. What do you think of these two teams, first of all? Well, right off the bat, this was a great match to start with. <clears throat> We've got two tag teams here that have to be considered uh, number one and number two contenders for the tag team championships currently held by Los Parks. So this is, a, this is a good match to have on the YouTube channel, free for the fans to watch, get a taste for what the tag team division is looking like at this point, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this tag match. Before we go praising the 5150, because we can sing a lot of praises about them, I just wanted to say it's been a while since we saw Injustice as a tag team since the last outing for them in MLW. Uh, looks like as a tag team, they're starting to look a little bit more solid and more collected. There was a lot of great double team moves that I saw there from 
uh, the two guys, members of Injustice, uh, more so than I saw in previous tag matches. I think that their tag team game has definitely picked up in strides, and I'm glad for that matter because, again, this is making MLW MLW's tag team roster look a lot stronger. Um, thoughts on Injustice? Yeah, I agree. I, I noticed they had the kind of matching trunk uh, colors, too. That's often a sign that they're going to step it up into high gear in the as a tag team. Of course, we know Myron Reed's the uh, the middleweight champion in MLW, so he's busy uh, defending his title also. But I think uh, I think it's fair to say that we'll probably see more of Injustice as a tag team in the future. Sure will, and they put on a great performance here. But against a debuting an MLW debut for the fifty one fifty, I again I believe they're called the fifty one fifty. They were referenced as LAX a few times. And I know, uh, I think it goes both ways. I think even on the Titantron screen, it says 5150, but also LAX. Um, it, it, when it comes to LAX, I, I I know that goes a long way back, Papa Smoke. Uh, maybe you can uh, fill in a little bit of the history of LAX as a team. Well, I, I first know of them from uh, TNA in the sort of late 2000s, kind of 2007, 8 type era as uh, Homicide and Hernandez. And they, I think they were managed by Conan back uh, even then for a while, too. I think they've had a number of different incarnations since then. But, uh, yeah, the Conan bringing back his team, we all know that uh, one of Conan's main strengths, since he hasn't been an in-ring competitor, is is in uh, scouting out talent and, uh, and uh, really... Uh, uh, kind of taking the skills of the wrestlers and uh, meshing them together and forming this tag team of and bringing back LAX with Slice, Boogie, and Rivera. Really nice touch, and uh, that that's Conan doing what he does best. Yeah, and they looked like a great team inside the ring, a lot of great stuff from 5150. I got to sing the praises of Slice, Boogie as a competitor. Not only does he look sharp and mean inside the ring, he's got a build about him, man. Like, he is somebody that looks intimidating, he comes across intimidating, and his work is absolutely just devastating. Like, I mean, when he hits a guy, it looks like he really hits a guy in there. Yeah, yeah. These guys look well coached. They've obviously already got some skill uh, from their uh, independent wrestling backgrounds and such. I don't know Rivera so well, but I've seen some of Slice Boogie stuff before. And I've got to agree with you. He looks the part. Uh, uh, that's half the work done in getting over, I think, is being a big guy, being a dude that works out and has that good body, and then uh, a fluidity and uh, and comfortable nature in the ring. He looks good. The guy I'm not as sure about is the manager, Dr. Julius Smokes. He, he definitely has the comical thing down, but uh, I, I can't quite uh, put my finger on him yet. I'll have to see a few more matches, but... Uh, Still, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, my mind is open to them. I'll check it out, and uh, I think they're a good trio. Yeah, definitely uh, an interesting uh, pairing uh, inside the ring and also an interesting uh, faction bring brought to the MLW front. So 5150 picking up a very big uh, debut win here against Injustice. Uh, this can only propel them. I don't think it's going to hurt Injustice in any way as a team. Again, we know they're very young building themselves up as well too and the tag division is hot as hell in MLW right now so great win for 5150 and then uh picking up more heat as it uh came to a close as well too yeah I I thought this match was good they also had a, a rule-breaking finish in which uh Jordan Oliver was kind of laying across the second rope and uh Dr. Julius Smokes uh, smacked him with a foreign object looked like some kind of a slapjack type I uh gimmick that he had there and uh they got the one two three and that when you think about the landscape of of mlw in the tag team division injustice is one of the main tag teams perpetually they're always up there in the rankings so to get that uh, uh pinfall victory for a new team like 5150 quite a big win and then yeah like you said kind of piling on the heat at the end uh, coming back, beating up both of Injustice after the bell, beating up the referee, pulling his shirt off, uh, uh, spray painting a big L on his back. They they had the crowd pretty riled up, and uh, that that's good heat that that brings them in as a strong tag team and, and tells the fans right off the bat these guys, these guys are a force to be reckoned with. 
You bet they are. Looking forward to seeing more from the 5150. And what a great way to transition into the next segment of MLW. Speaking of tag teams, uh, we go backstage and Alicia, too, is backstage with the Sea Stars. This is the team of, I believe, Ashley Vox and uh, Delmi. I can't pronounce the last name, so forgive me. I, I don't know if you know it, Papa Smokes, but I'd have a hell of a time trying to pronounce her last name. I think it's Delmi XO. There we go. That's yeah. probably right on the money there. So uh, she's back there interviewing them. They're going to be part of the new MLW featherweight division. Uh, while they're doing that, again, they're then joined by Willow Nightingale, who know, uh, knows them. Uh, I believe it was from Shimmer or Rise, one of the two that they mentioned, where the Sea Stars are actually the tag team champions. Willow Nightingale in there talking about how she'll be the star of the single division, but she's got a match later on that night against Ashley Vox on the show, so we'll get to see them two in action. And right then, finally, we break up the fun-loving babyface portion of the MLW Featherweight division, and Brittany Blake joins in, comes on in, mean look on her face, doesn't want to be part of any of this cute, fun-loving uh, babyface stuff. You know this woman needs business. She looks like she's there to go in kick some ass and win some gold eventually. And she's not going to put up with any of the smiling little bits that the other, the other women got going for them. Um, I think it was a good segment to get some of the names out on the screen. Like we were saying, we went through the names that were presented last week on MLW fusion alpha. This was an opportunity to actually see some of those names that we were kind of like, okay, not really too familiar. So we got to see four of them right off the hop here. I think personally, it was a great way to bring these four ladies out to start it off. And it's just bringing them in gently to uh, not not an in-ring confrontation or anything like that, but backstage with Alicia um, and not a fight or anything breaking down to anything, but just kind of drawing the line as to uh, who's going to play nice and who isn't going to play nice. And uh, we got the sea stars who are obvious uh, uh, faces and, and then uh, – Willow Nightingale as well, but then Brittany Blake coming out on the other side. So immediately it plants it into the fans' mind where we could see matches between some of these competitors. Yeah, great way to kick it off there. So right after that one, we had another backstage interview uh, going on, this one with Davari. Uh, but as he is uh, given this uh, promo, he is attacked by Alexander Hammerstone. And then who is attacked immediately by Mods Kruger. So again, Mods Kruger is still on the path of trying to prevent Hammerstone from being 100% or even making it to the match at Fightland against Jacob Fatu. Uh, your thoughts on this segment, Papa Smokes? Yeah, he, this segment was pretty good. And uh, Davari obviously uh, cut short in his promo by Hammerstone, but then showing that uh, Contra is still actively trying to prevent Hammerstone from having a successful match against Jacob Fatu. And you got to think of it this way, too, is is this has been Mods Kruger's only uh, mission throughout his entire uh, tenure in, in, in Major League Wrestling. So he's running out of time. And so he's going to have to start uh, doing things like this, attacking Hammerstone in the back. Uh, anywhere to try and maybe get an injury that would prevent his match or weaken him somehow for Jacob Fatu. The time, uh, the clock is ticking for Mods Kruger, and uh, that's why we have some backstage violence. We sure did. Uh, from there, speaking of violence, it's time to get back to in-ring action. We had the debut of the MLW featherweight division. It was going to be Ashley Vox taking on Willow Nightingale. And as we said from the segment, it was clear that we were getting two baby faces in this particular matchup. Again, not all the lines have been drawn. We haven't fully developed who's heel, who's babyface. We had a little snippet of it. But again, a chance to get these two women out there to see them. I think we mentioned that we had seen a little bit of Ashley Vox previously before uh, the MLW uh, featherweight division kicked off here and everything. But uh, obviously, uh, Delmi uh, in her corner because they are the tag team of the Sea Stars. Willow Nightingale comes out. I mean, man, I think she looks fantastic. I think the look is right. I think she's got babyface star written all over her at the moment, too. And then it comes down to the ring work. Um, Vox is, she she's a lot smaller. Don't get me wrong. She's definitely billed as the smallest member of the featherweight division. A uh, little on the light side and everything. But at the same time, great work rate inside that ring. I think that there's a lot of potential there with her. I think uh, definitely room to work and stuff like that, too. But I think she'll feel right at home working with some of these women that she's worked with for years and everything like that, a real good chance to develop. 
Uh, the big highlight for me had to be Willow Nightingale. I didn't know anything about Willow Nightingale going into this thing. And not only is it the look, but the personality and her in-ring work uh, is nothing to be laughed at. She actually has some strong in-ring work and I popped pretty decently when I saw the move where Vox is going to do the Irish whip into the corner and Nightingale turns it into a cartwheel followed by a super kick. I thought that was a beautiful spot, well played. And a uh, solid start to the MLW featherweight division. I, I enjoyed this match. Yeah, another thing I liked about this match is is kind of what you were touching on too, is sometimes a, a match doesn't need an angle, especially when the competitors are new to the Federation too. So sometimes a match can be just a match without an angle. I, I think some of the bigger companies forget this nowadays, but what they wanted to do, I think, is just get the ladies out there to have a match you know, a, a cold match, just a couple of, uh, nothing really on the line, no angle, no anything like that. Let's just let them go out there and show what they can do. And the fans in the 2300 building were, were hot for this match. It, 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 it was a pretty satisfactory match, nothing tremendously special about it, but that was just it. It, it didn't need anything special. We just, uh, I think MLW just wanted to showcase their talents and uh, get them out there in front of the crowd and get that first match out of the way. Then, like like we said with the uh, promo earlier with the Sea Stars and, and Willow Nightingale and Brittany Blake, you can start planting the seeds for what angle is to come, what what uh, conflict between the, the competitors will happen in the future. But at this point, get them out there and have a match and let's let's have a look at them and see what we can do. Even with what they teased, it almost kind of gives me the impression that inevitably I could see the sea stars becoming a heel grouping at the same time. Uh, they, they came out as clear baby faces here on this show, happy to be there, all this kind of stuff. But even the way Vox worked inside the ring and the look that she gives, some of the facials that she uses and stuff really screamed out eventual heel character and stuff. And Delmi obviously has got the size over, uh, Ashley Vox. So again, that pairing as a team too, especially in the heel mm. fashion, you've got the the smaller version, smaller person, and followed up by somebody who's got the more strength and stuff like that. I think it worked well well in a heel fashion, and I think it might come about with this whole thing with Willow Nightingale again too. I believe she's going to get a bit of a push up the ladder because she's got a look, she's got the size, she's got skill in the ring and personality for days. I think eventually. You could play on that, that the Sea Stars start to feel like they're being overshadowed by somebody that they were friends with, worked with for years, and eventually lean towards them beating the living daylights out of Willow Nightingale and stuff like that and starting a program there. I feel there's something within that, and they have teased it. Again, in typical MLW fashion, though, I think this will be fleshed out over a long period of time before we see that unfold. And I'm going to make a little prediction here, months, and we'll see in, in the coming weeks and months if there is any uh, uh, correctness to this. But when they did that promo with Alicia backstage before, uh, it looked like Delmi was going to be the first wrestler to speak after Alicia had introduced them. But it seemed like Ashley kind of cut Delmi off a little bit, and Delmi looked like a little bit pissed about it. I wonder if that's just a little seed being planted there too. Um, that the Sea Stars might come in as a tag team, but then have some kind of a breakup. I don't know. You know, I don't like to predict pro wrestling. I don't like to predict booking that's going to come on, that's going to come in the future. I don't want to spoil the surprise or anything like that. But I'm wondering if that might be a thing. Let's keep our eye on that in the future. For sure, seeds have been planted, so we know there's a lot to uh, go on there. But a great debut for the MLW. Uh, featherweight division and the ladies of MFW, it was a special spot simply because this was the first time the division had taken place in the ring. So great, uh, wonderful things there from them. Uh, right after this match, we had another uh, backstage segment. Uh, Alicia, too, was interviewing Davey Richards. Uh, during this time, he is interrupted by TJP. And man, I, I, I popped good for this one, Pop Smokes, when Davey Richards, being the gentleman that he is, is trying to tell Alicia maybe you should... Uh, step aside right now kind of thing because he knows there's a lot of heat there between these two and right as he does as soon as he's kind of guiding and being the gentleman that he is he gets popped one solid punch right in the face by djp the two of them are immediately broken up and what a great way to continue this this what i didn't know was going to be a feud 
but not that I'm complaining after the matchup they had. TJP and Davey Richards in a program I can get behind, especially after this. Yeah, I'm thrilled to see it, to be perfectly honest. The same as you, the, the, the match they had at, at Fightland was just uh, tremendous. And uh, I, I find myself respecting the style of TJP more and more. I, I know a lot of people don't like him out there in the wrestling world of, uh, to do with some out-of-ring stuff as well. I don't really even know about that. I like to just watch his work in the ring. He's smooth. He's slick. He does everything perfectly. He looks like a seasoned veteran in the way that he does stuff in the ring. And and same thing with Richards for sure. And uh, this is a money feud for them. They'll they'll get a, as many great matches out of this as they want. Yeah, you bet they will. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, from there, yeah. after that, uh, we continued to see the Hammerstone and Kruger still beating the living piss out of each other. No surprises there. Uh, but where the fun really kicked in was the 5150 promo that happened after that. We see uh, back uh, outside of the arena, I guess, just outside, we see the members. Uh, it's Rivera, it's Slice Boogie, and it's Dr. Julius Smokes. And what I really liked about this is the interaction that you don't get from a lot of companies and stuff. Right away, they're asking the cameraman, hey, what the fuck you doing sneaking up on us like that? So acknowledging the fact that there's this random camera outside where they're hanging out. And then it got more fun from there because Dr. Julius Smoke says the doctor just prescribed something and he holds up a big nugget of weed. And there's been times, Papa Smokes, I swear, where I've been tempted to sit here with a spliff or with a nugget of weed right on camera when we've been on camera. But I try to protect it a little bit thinking we're going to get canceled cancel culture is going to be all over us even though we're canadian and it's fucking legal here but at the same time i i love this segment i loved afterwards when they're trying to push the cameraman around and slice boogie asks him what size his shoes are as they're about to remove it from him i mean this this was fantastic it was comical but serious at the same time because these guys were having a laugh but the laugh was amongst them anybody else watching on and laughing are likely to go get punched in the face by these guys for having a laugh at this thing. Yeah, quite well done. And and again, just elevating them to the top heel uh, uh, area of the card, you know, like in the tag team division, we, we've got some heels and some faces, but they've, they've, they've smashed 5150 uh, into us here with uh, a, a whole lot of... Uh, high level heel tactics here and uh, heel promos and uh, they're, they're smashing them over into being a top tag team in the division and doing a good job. Of it. They really are. And, you know, quite frankly, I wouldn't uh, mind what the doctor prescribed there. Uh, I would love to have a uh, smoke off against Dr. Julius smokes and the members of uh, 5151 of these days, see if they could keep up to uh, Canada's uh, version of Cheech and Chong here over on uh, Ring Respect Radio. Yeah, yeah, we could put the stipulation of uh, winner gets to keep the last name Smokes. <laughs> well, I guess uh, we would forever still be calling you Papa Smokes, and he'd just be Dr. Julius uh, something. I'm not sure what. Yeah, but... I don't care what, as long as it's not Smokes. <laughs> I, I don't think that he would <laughs> want to put that on the line because he'd have a hell of a time going up against any Canadians, especially the two of us. Uh, from there, we had another backstage, another promo, this one featuring Joseph Samael. I mean, this goes without speaking. We're going to talk about how amazing this was because this man should be on a microphone all the damn time, always selling it, always selling his boys, and nothing short of amazing here with this one too, Pop Smokes. Yeah, Samael, so, so great on the mic, and I, I love all of his work, and uh, He's so poetic and so sinister in the way he uses words. I took a couple of quotations down uh, out of this promo because they sounded so good. One of the things he said was, going to war with Jacob Fatu is a suicide mission. Yeah. Really sounds good coming from the leader of Contra. And then uh, another quotation directly from Joseph Samuel was, uh, he promises to deliver a massacre of America's greatest infidel. Hey, isn't that great stuff? Like he, the, the man is a master of language, and he uses it to uh, to further his sinister uh, <clears throat> his sinister uh, uh, leanings that he has in professional wrestling, uh, being the head of Contra. And uh, man, just great use of words, uh, a, po a poet of destruction. And uh, Samuel, I love to listen to his stuff. He's a genius. Yeah, he sure is, man. And everything he says and does delivers. Uh, he is 
half, uh, I would say he's got to be contributing to half the reason the fight between Fatu and Hammerstone is as big as it is because he has carried the promotional side of that beautifully. And, you know, and take, not that he's the same kind of promoter, but I think of guys like Don King when it comes to boxing and the way he used to build up Mike Tyson. And that's the way Joseph Samael builds up Jacob Fatu. You don't want to mess with this guy. He's a dangerous man. It's a suicide mission. Hammerstone's in for a beating. And we're going to talk about that real soon here. Uh, but we're going to get to our main event of the evening from MLW Fusion Alpha 3. Speaking of which, would it actually be a championship match at Fightland for the MLW Heavyweight Championship as Matt Cross getting a championship opportunity. He's been begging Caesar draw on for on the last two episodes, now facing Jacob Fought too. Uh, we've said it before, we like Matt Cross. He's a good wrestler. He, in the right environment, can get a lot out of, out of a guy and stuff like that. I think this had already been sold to the point that there was no way this finish was coming with anything but Jacob Fatu walking away as champion. You're not building up fight land the way you are and throwing a guy the caliber. And don't take this the wrong way, anyone listening. I'm not trying to knock Matt Cross, but Matt Cross was in no position with MLW right now or anytime soon to be contending for the MLW Heavyweight Championship against Jacob Fatu and become a legitimate threat to the title. So it was pretty much writing on the wall from the start of this matchup where it was going. I feel this matchup wasn't by any means mind-blowing at all. It was it was decent enough. It was Jacob Fatu getting out there to do the thing he does. Matt Cross getting the opportunity to go and fight a champion. And it was an okay main event, but probably unfortunately one of my least favorite parts of the entire program and probably my least favorite of the main events that alpha has done since this uh restart here in the last few weeks i can see what you're saying here munson and i i, I agree with you to a certain extent um i kind of have the feeling that for uh, court bauer and mlw that this match the purpose of it really was to give the fans a, a little glimpse at Jacob Fatu before this the big money fight uh, we've had some matches with Hammerstone on TV recently but not that much with Fatu so I think they wanted to show him maybe uh, uh, highlight him a little bit and uh, find an opponent for him that's not busy in another angle or, or anything else and a good experienced guy that that will have a, a good match with Fatu and lift him up to look like the uh, dominant heel champion that he is and that's pretty much pretty much how this match went too it, it was quite satisfactory i thought uh, cross came out fast on offense kind of jump started the match used some aerial tactics kind of had fatu on the ropes a little bit for the first couple minutes of this and then they they went to the outside that's where fatu took over with his brawling style with uh, tremendous strength and striking power, he takes the the offensive outside the ring. Uh, once they came back into the ring, just like a good champion or a good heel champion especially, Fatu slowed this match down to his own pace. And he's quite a master of doing that. He's never in a rush. He doesn't have those happy feet bouncing around on the, on the mat the whole time. He's slow, he's deliberate, he's calculating in his movements. He makes all of his moves and, and holds and strikes count. They look uh, extremely realistic and all that. Um, there was a few other uh, shifts and swings in this match. I know Fatu went for the big Samoan thumb spike to the throat and missed that. And uh, Cross took advantage, got up on the top rope, gave Fatu the double stomp on the back. That was a nice spot. That made it look like Cross was still in this match. A couple of suicide dives. Got the fans chanting, holy shit, that's always a good sign. Cross tried for the shooting star press. Missed that. Fatu turns him inside out with a lariat. And then eventually, as all of Fatu's other opponents have experienced, Fatu gets up on that second rope, does the uh, springboard moonsault, and boom, pinfall. This was a this was a 12 or so minute match. Didn't have to be long, didn't have to have a million false finishes, or uh, drama, or comedy, or dancing spots in the middle of it, or anything like that. This was all business. 
I think it was to showcase the skills and the and the uh, stature of Jacob Fatu as MLW champion, and it did exactly that. It gave the fans a good look at the guy, what he can do, how devastating he can be, and, and the huge challenge that Hammerstone had before him uh, for the main event of Fightland. Yeah, you, did, you hit the nail on the head there for sure, and it did exactly what it set out to do. Uh, got people to see Jacob Fatu, especially, I guess, if they had not seen MLW before, and they tune into Alpha just to see what they were going to be in for the next night. Then it was a good opportunity to get him out there in front of someone. Again, my only real beef, I guess, is just, you know, with the writing on the wall, you clearly know where it's going. So it kind of, it does take a little way, a little bit away from the matchup itself. But again, I think even if uh, it weren't for the title fight the next night, I think we both would be in the right frame of mind to believe that this is not going to be the guy who was about to top, topple Jacob Fatu after two years. And again... That's not a slam at Matt Cross or his wrestling ability or anything like that. That's just pretty obvious in terms of where he stands on the card currently versus a guy of the caliber of Jacob Fatu. But speaking of Fatu, we're going to talk about the match between him and Hammerstone here right away, Papa Smokes. But before we do that, we want to talk a little bit about our new sponsor on the show. Oh, wait, I'm just fucking kidding. We don't have sponsors on the show. But if we did, we would hope that it would be as awesome as the next guest that we're about to talk to. We had an opportunity to sit down with a man who has made many great appearances on MLW Fusion and has worked quite a bit for MLW and also been in the industry for quite some time as well too. A man that we hope you'll enjoy listening to along with us. We're going to take us right now to an interview that we just did with Mr. Bud Heavy. Check it out. Awesome. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Ring Respect Radio. I am Bobby Munson, joined, as always, by the man with the angelic voice. He is Papa Smokes right there. And as you'll see, we're joined by a very special guest tonight. He is Mr. Bud Heavy. How the hell are you doing, sir? I'm living the dream, man. How about you guys? Well, we're doing great out here. Living the dream here in Canada as it starts to get colder and we're heading into the winter season. Uh, not sure what the weather's like out there, but, man, it's freezing out here opposite of that it is burning hot <laughs> where about whereabouts exactly are you from i am from florida beautiful so beautiful. yeah tampa florida i am in uh the closest you get before you're swimming in the water south nice, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so nice warm weather and lots of cold beers right correct which is speaking of that you know we had to stay <laughs> beautiful <laughs> that's what i love to see Especially from a couple of beer drinking Canadians like ourselves too. So oh, there you go. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we reached out to you because we've uh, been watching you this past year. We've been seeing you over on MLW, seeing a lot of great things. Uh, you've been a big standout for the two of us here. We wanted to get you on the show, uh, talk about that, just talk about just life in general, man, just uh, all casual. So I'm gonna kick it over to Papa Smokes here to take the reins here, see what uh, questions he's got. Yeah, really glad to have you on, Bud. Thanks a lot for being on here, but. We'll start it out nice and easy. Uh, how did you end up getting into the professional wrestling business? What what were some of the uh, stars that you liked watching when you were younger? And just give us a little introduction. Yeah, man. Uh, the, the first time I remember knowing I wanted to be a wrestler was like I was six years old. Um, and my dad had taken me to see a WCW show. And uh, we were front row. And Ric Flair uh, was in the ring. And I just remember watching him. And I was like, dude, there's just something special here. Like, I, I didn't know what it was at the time, but I was like in love and mesmerized. And then um, as time went on, like I fell in and out of love with it, I think as we all do. Yeah. Um, but when I, when I got a little bit older, um, you know, my wife was like, hey, you've always wanted to do it. You should try it. And I was like, yeah, no, I don't know how you get into that or whatever. You know, I, I don't know. You know, because at that time, it's, it was a lot harder than it is now to find a wrestling school. They were actually really, um, really hard to find a kind of underground. I made a joke about it, like I would do it if I could. I bet I could do it. Sure enough, she found a school. Uh, it just so happened to be Team 3D, which is the, the Dudley boys. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, she sent me straight there and uh, I started training. And then that's it really, it all just started kind of as like pressure from her. Um, a joke, if you will. <laughs> And I uh, started training there. Yeah. And then Jay Lethal after that. I did a year there and then did Jay Lethal after that. And that's, that's where I'm out of. 
Beautiful. How, how long ago that was that? How long you been in the, in the business for? Seven years now. Awesome. Jeez. Really <laughs> Time flies, eh? Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, of course, we'll we'll get to talking about MLW, but uh, where else uh, might people f- uh, find some of your work, some of your body of work that's happened in those seven years? Yeah, man, a lot of it's down here in Florida because uh, we have uh, the the crippling death of three hour drive to get out of our state, so most of us get stuck down here. Um, so I worked at Tampa Bay Pro Wrestling for all of my career. Um, you can find a lot of my matches there on Fight TV as well, but they have YouTube. Um, Real Pro Wrestling out of Fort Myers, Florida. Um, that's been the home home. Uh, those guys have had my back since day one. And uh, I feel like it's just, it's the island of misfit toys and I seem to fit right in. Um, <laughs> and then uh, there's a bunch of other promotions around the state of Florida. Um, ACW, which used to be a WWN place, which they used to do like uh, Evolve and all that. It was under that umbrella. I've, I've wrestled there quite often. So yeah, I, a little bit of those places. Nice. So uh, when did the call from MLW first come about? Man, that was, <laughs> it was, it was funny. Um, the, the, the guy that I, uh, I, one of the guys I trained with, he, he's the ring owner and MLW just so happens to be uh, needing uh, people to aid in certain things. Uh, and he was like, Hey, I need your help, you know, tearing down, putting it up. And I showed up, man. And uh, I just kept showing up. So I showed up at two shows. Um, and they, they, they were like, I drove up to Chicago with him and they were like, here's a dark match. And, um, that's just where it all started, man. They were like, thanks for coming. Here's an opportunity. We hope you don't blow it. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly not if they keep calling you back. Yeah. I don't know, man. Uh, it's weird. Um, it, it's weird. I, I hadn't like, I won't say I had no intention, but I had zero thought that they would use me. Um, I mean, look at me, <laughs> you know, so, but they did. So, you know, I can't complain. <laughs> and how about that Philly crowd at, uh, at the uh, taping for a MLW Fusion Alpha? I mean, we were, we were big fans already. We really enjoyed what you've been doing so far, but that crowd was firmly behind you, man. What a great reaction. The shocker was, was I had no entrance. So they were just going to walk me out and let me, you know, it's a typical enhancement talent thing that we do, right? Yeah. But then I get out there and somebody says my name. I'm like, yeah, hey, you know, I was like, maybe one person. That's cool. Then one more, then one more. And if you look at the video, there's a moment where I'm laughing because I have no clue what to do. Um, what's going on here? Like, they're fixing to, like, you know, I'm, I'm going to get shoot for this. Like, there's no way they appreciate this, you know? But they were, they were all about it, man. They, they enjoyed it. And, uh, yeah, it was wild and that feeling, man. It was it was insane to think of it. Like it's a twenty three hundred arena. Like that's, I mean, obviously we all know the history that place holds. Um, and standing in that same arena and having them say my name, uh, I mean, I am telling you now, I could have you could have been like, all right, that's it, you're done. And I'd have been like, yeah, cool, I did it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Now, before yeah. I send it back to Papa Spoke, speaking of that night at the same time, you have got to have some of the biggest set of nuts on the planet because. You not only flipped the bird to Alex Kane of all people, but with King Mo right at his side, man. I don't know anybody else on this planet who would have the uh, the testicular fortitude, as they used to say, to do such a thing. But you, sir, <laughs> fucking A, it was awesome. Uh, I'll tell you this much. Um, that kid's a fucking monster. <laughs> I'm just, <Sure> is. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. Um, a monster. And... Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I paid the price. I mean, those three more suplexes after all the ones that happened during the match. Not to mention the kick to the back during that thing that I think I peed blood for about a week after that. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a shit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll take it over to Papa Smokes again here. Well, you were talking about... Uh... Alex Kane being a monster, but we've seen you fight some other monsters in MLW. I was wondering what it's like to, uh, you know, even with some pre-match preparation and stuff, it's got to be a little bit scary to look across the ring and see you're going to be fighting Low Key or Mads Kruger. What's that feeling like to get to the ring and see them there across from you? Uh, surreal. Um, I didn't, you know, 
it was weird standing out there. I was like, yeah, cool. It's just another match. You know, it's no big deal. And then Key's music kicked and I was like, oh shit. <laughs> like, wait a minute. That's Loki. You know, like it didn't set in until I was like out there and the lights were on. And like when he came through the entrance, man, I was like, uh oh, like yeah. it, it, it all changed. Um, and the same kind of goes for Mads too. Uh, I mean, like he's, God, he's seven foot tall. You know, he's a monster. And uh, until you see him in there, you know, you can see him in the locker room, you know, in, in his lonesome little corner. Um, and he just does not seem as big as he is when he is in that ring and he's standing across from me. And obviously his eyes change. Uh, both of their eyes change. I mean, Loki looks like he's come from another planet. I mean, the minute he gets in there, his whole demeanor changes. And uh, he hits you like a semi-truck. Obviously, I'm sure you guys saw that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure you know. <laughs> so outside of wrestling, though, uh, what uh, what keeps you busy? What uh, what do you like to do in your spare time? Man, uh, I got two kids. Um, I take care of my kids. It's my whole world. Um, my wife and my kids. Outside of that, man, I play a lot of video games. I'm pretty much a nerd. <laughs> so, yeah, obviously, there's Godzilla behind me. You know, like, <laughs> um, so I watch, uh, I, I play a lot of, uh, I play a lot of games, watch a lot of movies with the kids. Um, just a lot of chilling, man. I try to keep it calm because the weekends are, uh, are hectic. So I, during the week, I try to keep it calm, you know? <laughs> so are you on the road most of the time with wrestling then? Um, yes. Yeah, so ever since MLW, it's, uh, it's increased a lot. The pandemic hurt, obviously I'm not the only one that it hurt. Um, but as of lately, it's been roughly about um, at least one show every weekend. Uh, and sometimes two, sometimes if I'm lucky, three. Um, it's hard to get out of our state, like I said earlier. So a lot of them are just within our state, three, four hour drives here and there. Some six, if you want to go all the way to Georgia line. But yeah, most of the time it's there. So this, I think all the way through November, I think we have at least one show a weekend. So yeah. yeah. So outside yeah. of the outside of the U.S. in the uh, seven years that you've been doing this, have you traveled outside uh, to the other countries to do work yet, uh, or is there a desire to? There's a huge desire to. I mean, um, I haven't yet. Uh, Mexico was in talks. Um, I hope that that goes through. Uh, the U.K. was in talks for a minute in the January, um, and I hope. Something like that happens, man. I'm I'm down 110 percent. You know, just to do it everywhere, man. Japan is the uh, the end all be all. I think all of us say that. I'm pretty sure that come you know that do this. Japan would be phenomenal. Um, hopes and dreams. <laughs> well, well, if you're ever through Canada, make sure to give us a call because we uh, we uh, help run a uh, local promotion here. So I'm sure we could get you on a few circuits out this way. Get out of here. I would love that, man. That would be amazing. Canada has always been one of the coolest places I always thought. So that'd be really cool. I'm serious. And we'd have to drink some beer while we're there. Oh, hell yeah. Man. That, that's, that's all we do here in our spare time. So. It's all I do most of the time. Yeah. You, you so would make to a Canadian that. then. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm chill and I drink beer all the time. Oh, and I like hockey. I don't know. Dude, shit, yeah. Are you sure you're not born here? Yeah. Office <laughs> folks. Oh uh, yeah, I I was wondering what's what's in the future for Bud Heavy. What kind of ideas do you have for uh, titles or uh, uh, bookings you want to get in Florida or elsewhere? Uh, do you have a, a long term plan or an end game? Uh, dude, really in game is, is, is to be contracted. Um, and, and MLW right now is, is, um, it's the home. Uh, I feel like, you know, there's something, I don't know what it is. I couldn't tell you, uh, <laughs> but I'm hoping that, you know, they can, uh, make something happen, you know, cause I'm down. Um, the other indie goal wise man is GCW, uh, game changer is the, is the big goal. Um, I got a lot of friends that are on there. So I'm like, you know, hey, hook a brother up. But, you know, it's <laughs> tough. Um, it's tough out there, you know. Everybody's fighting for bookings, and I understand it. But that's probably one of the biggest goals is, uh, is the contract and, and, and GCW, man. Those are the two right now. Um, I don't ever really see myself um, 
I, I don't try to plan too far ahead because uh, then I just disappoint myself. <laughs> you know, so, exa- exactly, man. And, and uh, you know, everything I've done is past what I wanted to do. So my wife always makes that point to me because I'll get disappointed. And she's like, you do know when you started wrestling, you just wanted to do it, you know, once, maybe twice a month. And then it just got, you know, obviously that doesn't happen. Once it bites us, it bites us hard and now we're stuck. <laughs> so she's like, remember, you've already had your goal made. So stop freaking out about other things, you know. Everything, so, everything now is over and above anyway, so it's all good. Yeah, exactly. Like everything's, everything's just extra points now. <laughs> <laughs> so quite clearly, Bud Light, favorite go-to for beer? Yep, yep, dude. Um, I don't know why either. I couldn't tell you. It's not the best beer. <laughs> but, uh, it's always the there. It does, and it's it's funny because that's how it, that's how it happened. Was you know we were sitting there and I was drinking one night and somebody was like, you know, you're kind of chunky, and I laughed. You know, I was like, yeah, I know, and I was like, it's all the bud. And then they're like, yeah, the bud's making you heavy. And then someone's like, have bud heavy. And then I was like, oh my god, <laughs> wait a minute. And I was like, that's genius. And then it just stuck. And so somebody's reading a comment on, on YouTube the other day, or no, on Twitter. Somebody's like, I hate that his name is a fat joke. And I was like, well, I named myself that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm okay with it. <laughs> like, What's the issue? <laughs> yeah, I didn't see, you know, because I, I get it. You know, like if somebody else named me, I might be bad. But like, I totally came up with it. And like, I mean, I know the reason I'm fat is because I drink so much beer. <laughs> so, and I ain't stopping, so. <laughs> yeah, whatever. You're doing exactly. what you love and you get to drink at the same time, so fuck it, who cares? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> who cares, right? Yeah. Exactly. I'm, I'm hoping, you know, that's what they wanted to do on MLW, though. Know? They're like, dude, just be bud, man. Just, just you know, always, always be around with a beer in your hand and always have fun. And I'm like, dude, you're just asking me to be me. That's easy. <laughs> I got this. You, you can you know? get paid to drink beer and take an ass kick, and I mean that's a, that's a dream come true if you ask me. Right, exactly, man. And you know, like it's the thing too about like uh, somebody asked me that too. They were like, um, "How does it feel uh, every match you've been booked in? You you lost?" And I was like, "Guys, like I'm kind of still there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't really care. I'm still there. <laughs> like I don't really know what to tell you." I think too many people get hung up on that and stuff like that too. Like I remember some of the standouts for me as a kid in the nineties and stuff were the guys that didn't pick up all the wins all the time. I liked seeing these guys and rooting for the underdog and stuff. I knew there was probably no chance I'd see them pick up a victory, but something inside of me wanted to tune in every time, just in case that guy was going to take the win. And Hey, that's, that's what you are. And you know, at the same time, that's why it picked up for us. We saw you there and, we liked what you were doing. We love the name. The name stood out for us too and everything. And awesome. just, just the fun that you're having at the same time, man. That's the kind of shit we really enjoy and why we wanted to reach out at the same time too. So, Yeah, you know, that's what it was all about for me. It was like, I, I, you know, even just like Bud himself, like his, you know, it, I wanted him to be accessible. Like I wanted everybody to feel like they could be Bud. You know, like I'm not shredded. You know, I, 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 I look pretty average. Um, <laughs> except for the tan I mean I'll be honest but <laughs> but I look pretty average and um and I was like you know I just want everybody to feel like you know hey man if I ever had the dream to be a pro wrestler like I don't have to stop drinking beer and look like freaking Roman Reigns you know <laughs> not that I wouldn't want to look like that but <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that up to him <laughs> yeah right we'll leave that side of the game to you buddy I'll enjoy my beer over here you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Bob Smokes, you got some more for us? Well, I was going to say, do you remember Munson when we watched and reviewed uh, Filthy Island for yes. MLW? Yeah. And <laughs> we, were, we were laughing about the setup and all that stuff. And then we said, look, that's Bud Heavy doing the music in the entrances over there. And that was the first time we really had a good laugh about that. Yeah. How, how was that, by the way? Uh, It was hilarious. Um, they They were just like, you want to be a DJ? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I'm thinking like a DJ. I didn't know what they meant, you know? Like they didn't tell me exactly what's going on. They sit down and they hand me these cassette tapes and I'm like, what the hell? And they're like, put them in the thingy and push play. And I was like, what are we in the nineties? Like, hold on a second. Like, I don't think anyone even knows how these work anymore. <laughs> it was great. But then, you know, when the Von Erics came up in the Jeep, um, I was so upset. The camera angle they had, 
they almost hit me. They were like this close to hitting me. I dove out of the way last minute. My foot hit a tire. They didn't catch it in the camera. I was like, <laughs> that would have been awesome. <laughs> yeah, you would have been more of a hero than that boy, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, it was fun man and tom seemed to have a blast with it and uh he, it was his choice apparently he was like you know make fun to dj he fits the gimmick i was like it kind of does <laughs> <laughs> sure <laughs> oh glad you glad you're having fun with it man we're enjoying it uh if papa smokes any last questions you got no no you got anything bob no i got uh, nothing else but they uh why don't you tell everyone uh, listening uh, where else they can find you, uh, where on social media they can find you, and anything uh, to look forward to? Yeah, man, it's, uh, it's on Facebook. It's Bud Heavy. Um, on Twitter, it's Bud underscore Heavy. Uh, everybody has trouble finding me because there's people that try to steal my shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Instagram is Bud Heavy with two Y's because uh, again, everybody tries to steal my shit. Um, so, uh, and on the Facebook store, there's the t-shirts, man. You guys can, you know, buy merch and stuff like that. Uh, hopefully, um, there'll be more to come. Uh, I'm hoping that MLW bites, man, and may something happen. So, you know, keep your eyes out. There's more coming. Um, I can tell you that much, but you know, yeah. Perfect. Well, we appreciate you being on the show here today. Uh, we're going to wrap this one up, but uh, thank you for sticking around, telling us all about you, and we look forward to the future with Bud Heavy. Everybody take care and have a great evening. Oh, man, what a fun interview that was, Papa Smokes. Bud Heavy, I mean, we were a fan of him before this interview, after that interview. I think we've made a friend for life out of this guy. What a fantastic man. Yeah, what a cool guy, hey, Munson, a, and a great interview. We've had such luck uh, interviewing uh, guys from uh, wrestling companies so far, and uh, Bud Heavy, very cool guy, very interesting guy, very down-to-earth, nice guy, and uh, I, I wish him all the best in the future. Yeah, I feel like we have a new friend here, too, a very cool guy. Yeah, awesome human being, so go check out his work on MLW and everywhere else you can see him, and make sure to support local independent wrestling because it's guys like Bud Heavy that need your support as well too. Uh, so we're going to move on. Uh, MLW Fightland. I know that there was two matches on the card from that night, Papa Smokes. I know you haven't seen the middleweight championship matchup. Uh, just go ahead and say it. congratulations to Jiri, the new MLW middleweight champion. Um, we might get down to watching it sometime soon, maybe talk about it. But it pretty much was kind of what you predicted. It was a uh, Bit of a spot fest, a bit of exactly what you get from a cookie cutter four way match. Not to take away from the guys in the matchup, but it's pretty much what you expect to see when you see four guys in the ring these days. Them try to get their shit in within a certain amount of time. Two guys in the ring, two on the outside, switch back and forth. Bada bing, bada boom, match done, new champion. And then we got that really, really long podcast piece that was in between. And with all due respect to everybody involved, so unnecessary when you could have at least put another match or some promo stuff on this card. I feel Alpha was heavier with what it puts in an hour show than what Fightland produced on Vice TV. And again, not taken away from what they did. I mean, the whole focus was going to be on this matchup that we're about to talk to. Uh, most anticipated fight of the year. And it was, was not just called this because they wanted to call it. It was called this because it's fucking true. Jacob Fatu taking on Alexander Hammerstone. It's the MLW Heavyweight Champion against the MLW National Openweight Champion. Both these men champion for well over two years now. I mean, okay, we can count the fact that coronavirus brought a little bit of a damper to that, but I still believe, based on what I've seen, that these two would have been champion all through that period of time as well, too. Kept away from each other so well. This turned into what was ended up being a no-DQ matchup, which... Outside of, you know, a few spots that I guess we could definitely say were no DQ, including a certain table spot in this matchup and a couple of chair spots, I don't think there was a lot that justified even bothering calling it a no DQ. I know we were speaking about this before. I mentioned that you could have almost just said that the referee could have turned a blind eye to a couple of these spots because of the nature of the matchup and how big it is. Sometimes the referees are a little bit more lenient with those main events and stuff like that. I think... That could have been sold that way. But again, glad that Fatu and Hammerstone didn't oversell the no DQ stuff. There was a lot of wrestling in this match. There was a lot of big guys 
throwing around other big guys in this matchup. Jacob fought too with that moonsault off the uh, barrier outside to Hammerstone. Just a lot of great things. And then talk about fucking just amazing. Hammerstone breaks his fucking ankle or whatever it is he did in that one spot. And can not only continues the matchup, but some of the moves, we were in awe of how well they were performed. That missile drop kick from the top ropes that he still pulled off with that ankle the way it is. I got to say, man, this, this was great matchup, great main event between two main event level guys. I like this one a lot. Um, is it my favorite match of the year? Maybe not quite, but I think that there was a couple things that held it back. Again, Hammer's ankle held it back just a slight bit. The no DQ thing held it back a slight bit. But those are, again, we've talked about it before, that's splitting hairs. Other than that, this was a fantastic piece of brilliant wrestling done by MLW once again and by two guys who are, in my mind, two of the best stars in the professional wrestling world today. And for me, months, and this, this match took me back to the, the glory days of, of my wrestling fandom when I was a kid when the business was more protected like that and you would have a title match teased and they would keep the competitors from that away from each other for a long time. No schmozzles in the ring, no factions beating up on each other, no anything, just keeping them far away from each other except verbally. And uh, this, they started teasing this match before the COVID shutdown even happened in 2020 and all the fans without so much to watch during the quarantine uh, shutdown times and all that. We're just speculating about this match. When could it? When might it happen? When could it happen? Uh, who would win? What would happen with with Contra? And what would happen with Hammerstone? So much to think about. The the fans wanted this match for a long time, and I think Cord Cord Bauer and his staff were extremely smart to to let it go for a while. Let the let the fans start drooling for this match before you actually sign it or, or give them what they want everybody uh, you know in wrestling nowadays so much stuff is just uh, given uh, with the short attention span like given immediately uh, you know tons and tons of these grudge matches just happen so quickly and then the feud is over no this to me is is good old style 70s and 80s wrestling where it's like a big fight it's like a title fight in boxing it gets signed and then you wait a couple of months before it actually happens while the guys are training and it just builds a great sense of of tension and uh, expectation amongst the the fans and and we waited all this time till Fightland when it finally came it, it had that big fight feel it had that huge title fight feel even though MLW isn't the biggest uh, company in wrestling by a long shot they got it out there, and, and, and a, there was a huge buzz, as you noticed, that it, in, in the weeks and months leading up to this. But in that last week, boy, there were a lot of people that don't normally watch MLW that were going to tune in to watch this match come hell or high water. And that's exactly what Bauer and, his, and MLW wanted from this, to get some new eyes on their product, whether they're re casual wrestling fans or smarks or... or you know anything in between that that they wanted new eyes on their product and I'm quite sure they got it with this I haven't read the numbers uh, afterwards or anything like that but I I bet you it had the hugest viewership that MLW has had for any single match up to this time it must have and I haven't exactly checked the numbers myself either but a few things that I can comment on I've seen the coverage that they have had worldwide with different publications talking about the MLW Fightland, the happened on Vice TV, about everything that led up to it, all this kind of stuff. So great that they're being talked about there, but I saw a lot of comments that came from people who watched the show, and a lot of them, people who had never watched MLW before. I'm not even sure if they're wrestling fans of the past that tuned back in because they had just watched Dark Side of the Ring prior to that, or if they happen to be wrestling fans who had just never tuned in to MLW, they're more WWE, AEW guys. I'm not entirely sure, but if many of the comments ranged along the lines of, I've never seen your product before, but you made a fan for life out of me now. So whatever it is they did, I mean, we, we can nitpick the little things because we watch week in and week out and stuff like that. But again, they put on a great production here. They put on a show that obviously was going to gather a lot of attention. They used their two biggest stars 
to lead into that whole thing. And if this is what draws eyes to MLW, then kudos to Court Bauer and everything they've been doing because it's finally paying off. And it's hopefully going to put some people on notice that this is how you can run a wrestling program in a modern age. You can still give it, like you said, that 70s and 80s feel, that big fight feel that becomes so exciting. And deliver it with a modern twist. There is nothing about these guys that says they don't fit in a modern day wrestling, but the way it's booked uses the psychology and the the history that is behind the way that wrestling was put together once upon a time. And I think too many people forget about it. I, we were having a joke about this beforehand, but it's almost like the other companies, it's like kids with the new toys. They, they get their new toys, they got to take them out and they got to put them the, the stars of the show are right away kind of thing. There's no build to it. There's no excitement level after it. There's no fallout from it. As where this, this has been built up for so long. These two tore each other down. I mean, Hammerstone comes out with it, broken ankle, but victorious at the same time. So new champion, wonderful there. And this is great. Again, they're not going to go bounce back and give us MLW Fusion Alpha this Wednesday and have... Hammerstone have fought two part two already. This is a company that understands longevity. And if there is a Hammerstone and fought two part two, it is going to be at a big event and it is going to take time before it happens again. I believe that Hammerstone will go into other programs before him and fought two ever step toe to toe in a ring again. Yeah, I think you're right about that. And it's fun to just think of with all the new acquisitions that uh, MLW has had over the past while what direction they might go in uh, Hammerstone's championship reign. He's obviously going to work as a baby face by the look of it anyway. And uh, they've got a great uh, roster of heels and baby faces, which can come up against uh, him in future title matches on future uh, pay-per-view or, or uh, big events. Uh, the, the, the sky is wide open for MLW right now. They Everything's fresh now. they got a new champion. I assume they'll have a new national openweight champion. They've now got a new middleweight champion. they got a ladies division. Man, the sky's the limit for these guys. So uh, it's almost like a restart has been pushed again. And we've got these new stars like we've been talking about. Alex Kane, EJ Nduka, uh, Mads Kruger, a whole bunch of guys that have uh, come up th- – over the past year, they really haven't uh, stepped into main event roles yet, but probably will at some point. And uh, it's just fascinating to think of all the possible booking combinations that are out there. Well, and then all the new names that have dropped as well, too. Bobby Fish working over there, Alex Shelley coming in. Uh, you got Davey Richards, guys like that as well, too. I mean, the roster is endless at this point, and just so many great matchups that they can be had. And then the big news that dropped at Fightline as well, too, uh, Will Ospreay signing with MLW. He's going to come over to the North American market. I mean, there is a plethora of matches that could be uh, given to Will Ospreay. Again, many people used to seeing him in his element over in uh, Japan, working with New Japan Pro Wrestling. The style definitely will be different in MLW, but at the same time, looking at matches between guys like TJP and David Richards gives me hope that that's the direction we're going to see Will Ospreay go in in those technical type matchups. And I think he's a guy that could carry well in there working with uh, some of the guys that they have, especially some of the experienced guys. I think we'll see a lot of great things for MLW moving forward. Uh, uh, Hopefully the bigger audience is going to help. It will continue to push fusion alpha as well too. And kudos Corp Bauer, man, you've been pushing hard and all the accolades are coming your way as a result. So big kudos from myself and Papa Smokes. And again, kudos to all of you for tuning in here today. We hope you enjoyed our review of MLW Fusion Alpha 3, as well as our uh, Fightland main event review, and also our talk with Bud Heavy. So go check him out on social media, check out his work, and make sure to reach out to him. He's a solid dude. He's willing to sit down, have a beer, and shoot the shit with you. And we really enjoyed our time here with Bud Heavy today. So thank you once again for tuning in to Ring Respect Radio. Uh, Once again, click the subscribe button down below. Let all your friends know about the show. And do what you can to help us out. We appreciate it. And we appreciate each and one of you. Thank you and have a good night. When you go to the old saloon at the Dead South End. Gonna find you a man there wants to be your friend. If you dare to deny his wish, you'll be dead by dawn. So give him a drink and a smile.
snacks with white faces. Don't go putting them down.